and hear the preaching of God's word, let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this day which thou hast made, that we may rejoice and be glad in it on this, the first day of the week, the Lord's day. And how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We thank thee for our brethren. We thank thee we dwell together in unity. And as newborn babes we desire, then since your milk of thy word, whereby you may grow thereby. Sanctify thy truth, for thy word is truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us turn to our Bibles, the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 18. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 18, it is written, Come now, what a day to be living in. We're living still in this day in which God is still willing <coughs> For all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This is still the day of grace that anybody can come to the Lord. God has given his call to come now. And he still has that call now <coughs> that we can come to the Lord. This is why since I've been born again for the past 27 years, we continue to obey Christ's great commission to go into the world and to preach the gospel of creature. Why? Because the Lord is still calling out to souls to come to him. We're still living in a time that's exciting. We see the signs of the times. We see it is the last days, but Christ has not yet returned. And why is that? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but it's long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is willing for all to come to repentance, and his call is to come now. And again, now is the appointed time. Today is the day of salvation. We can come now to the Lord. How many say, well, let me wait let me get my wife, my life straight. Oh, let me wait. I'll go to church next month. Or, or let me wait. I'll do this. No, we can come now to the Lord. Anytime we can come now to the Lord. Back in 1995, I was not yet born again. I was a heathen, idol worshiping around my neck. Around my neck was big idols one of which was very expensive. You see, I was raised here in Thailand since I was 16 years old. Back in 1990, when I first arrived to Thailand, I was 16 years old. My earthly father was a U.S. soldier, and he was stationed out of the American embassy. And because they had him working on the U.S. embassy, and he would go to Vietnam every other month, and spent a whole month or two in Vietnam, but they had him work at the U.S. Embassy. They gave him diplomatic status, which meant his dependents, like his son, myself, could then go to the big fancy schools and have diplomatic, uh, diplomatic status here in Thailand. So I moved here in 1990, and the only thing I could think about back in 1990 was Muay Thai or Thai boxing. I was a, I grew up in the martial arts. I grew up fighting in America, and America is not heaven. It is hard being what they call a mix. Now, there's no such thing as mix. There's only one race, the human race. We're all colored. There's no black, there's no white. God gave the first man, Adam, his name Adam, which means in Hebrew, reddish brown. We're all reddish brown. There is no black, there is no white. Some are more reddish than others, and some are more brownish than others, but we're all reddish brown. But in America, they believe in the different races, which is wrong. And they considered me a mixed race, which was very wrong, and they did not really appreciate me. But when I excelled in martial arts, everybody then had to respect me. So I grew up doing martial arts, 
and I got completely obsessed with Muay Thai or Thai boxing when I was 14 years old back in America. And then when I was 16, my earthly father moved here to Thailand and invited me to live here. And all I could think about was Muay Thai and Thai boxing. I got off the airplane and was looking for Thai boxing everywhere that I went and eventually started training and then began fighting here and became a Thai boxer here in Thailand and even used to fight on Thai television out of a Thai gym representing that gym on Thai television in the Thai boxing here. But in 1995, here I was a heathen Thai boxing. I was a Buddhist like the Thai people are because of Thai boxing and the Thai people mixed Buddhism with animism and Brahmanism, Hinduism, together into one religion. So what they call Buddhism here is actually three religions in one. It is Theravada Buddhism mixed with Brahmin Hinduism mixed with animism, which is spirit worship, black magic, and things such as that. And these idols I had around my neck were supposed to protect me from guns and knives and things such as that. I was not a good person back then. Around my wrists were strings that were given to me by witch doctors that were supposed to give me power when I punch people and not break my hands or break my wrists and be able to hurt people with the special powers given to me by witch doctors. I was living with my girlfriend, who's now my wife, and we've been living together in sin, the sin of fornication, for three years. Those three years are hard. We would fight. We would break up. We'd break furniture. We'd break up, get back together, fight again, break furniture, break up, and it just went on over and over again. I used to, because of Muay Thai and Thai boxing, those Thai boxers are poor. And whenever they got money, they would drink alcohol. Lots and lots of alcohol. And I used to do the same. They used to smoke marijuana. I used to smoke it as well. Practice witchcraft, gamble, and do all these sins that I was in back in 1995. I was a sinner. I was a heathen. I knew back then that if I died, I would go to hell. I was afraid of death back then because I knew that when I died, I would go to hell. And whenever I saw death, and back then in the 1990s, death was everywhere here. People were dying right and left. Whenever I saw death, I would get very afraid, knowing inside I'm going to go to the bad place. Nobody had to tell me. Nobody had to preach. I knew it on the inside. I was on my way to hell. But in 1995... I began seeking for the God who could answer prayer. I was an idol worshiper. I worshiped idols. I was practicing black magic and things such as that. But deep down inside, I wanted to know, was there a God? A God who could answer prayer. So, of course, as a Buddhist, I went to the Buddhist temple. Now, the Buddhist temple is a place where we'll do ceremonies. But I went there on this day to ask a question which Buddhists do not do. I went there on this day to ask the abbot, could Buddha answer our prayers? The abbot of the temple said, no. No, you've got to help yourself. You just can't sit around and call out to the sky and somebody help you. You've got to help yourself. I tried to ask more to this abbot. He thought by me asking questions that I was challenging him and challenging his religion. And though I was a Buddhist myself, he kicked me out of the temple. I was angry. I was upset. I just wanted to ask some questions. He got kicked out of the temple. Well, next to the temple was a Muslim mosque. Now you see they're on two different roads, but the roads came in at an angle and they ended at a canal. So there at the canal, the temple and the mosque were side by side, but on two different roads. So I exited the back and walked down the sidewalk on the canal and went to the mosque. 
full of Thai men. No Thai women, just all Thai men. And those men, we spoke Thai together. They were Thai. I grew up speaking Thai. And I asked them in Thai, could their God answer prayer? They grabbed me, pulled me into the mosque, and demanded that I repeat after them some phrases in Arabic. I do not speak Arabic. I did not know what we're even saying. I tried to ask them in Thai, what are you wanting me to say? They were trying to force me just to say it in Arabic and get it over with. I escaped from them, ran out of the mosque, confused now, and I looked up to the sky and I asked God to send somebody to me. I told God I believe he was real and if he could send somebody to me. Well, a few days later, I met another man. He was half Thai and half Australian. I'm half American, half Vietnamese, so he had what they call the mixed look. And we met together, we became friends, sort of talking together. He invited me to eat with him, and we ate lunch together, and he asked me, what religion are you? Well, I answered, as I've been answered for many years, out of habit, that I was a Buddhist. But I remembered, I'm seeking for God. I remembered, I prayed for God to send somebody to me. And I thought now, is this the man? Is this the man God sent to me? So I said to him, but I believe that there is a God who can answer prayer and I'm looking for him. He said, do you know what? When I left the house, this house you're staying at, at that time, God told me to give a certain book to you. And he later confessed he doubted it was God, but he did it anyway. And he went through his backpack to pull this little booklet out and said, this is for you. I told him, I'm going to read this book. Thank you. I put it in my pocket. Now, this was in 1995. There was no sky trains or subways or MRTs, BRTs, BBCs, whatever they are. There was none of those back then. We had to take a boat on a canal. And the canal water is black, dirty black water. And so when you sit on the canal boat, you cannot read anything because you have to dodge the water coming in. You have to sit in the canal boat like a boxer. Now, of course, people would fall asleep and water would just get on them, but somebody like me wants to protect the face. So I didn't want that water getting on me, and so I don't have time to read that booklet. But on the boat ride, all I could think about was that book. I wanted to read it. I get to the little apartment we're in that time. I pull the booklet out and begin reading it, and I saw in big, bold letters, Mark chapter 11, verse 24, in which Jesus Christ says, Therefore I say unto you, What thing soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Now, though I'm American and have Vietnamese and grew up in Thailand, I'm an English speaker. And very rarely up to that time had I ever seen the word shall. That is absolute truth. There is no stronger verb in the English language than the word shall. So much so that before 1985, I very rarely heard the word shall. And here it was in big bold letters, ye shall have them. Not might, not be, shall have them. I thought this is crazy. Who would write this in a book? And in the booklet, it went on to say, this is God's word. God cannot lie. I started thinking, wait a second. The Bible is God's word, and it has promises like that in it? That means that I can test God's word out. Isaiah 1, verse 18, once again. Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. We can come to the Lord, not out of fearful submission. We can reason with the Lord. We can use our own reasoning with God. God is so amazing. Here in the world, if any man has some kind of earthly position or power, you cannot go talk to them. Just like in the Buddhist temple I just testified about. 
just by me asking the abbot of the temple questions, he kicked me out as if I was challenging him, as if I was challenging his position, not God. God is God. He's the God of gods, the Lord of lords. There's none higher than God, yet he says we can come to him and we can reason with the Lord. So here I have this promise in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, in which Christ says, Therefore I say to you what things you desire when you pray, but believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. The writer of the book that said this is God's word. God cannot lie. I came to the Lord to reason with him. I said, okay, Lord, if this, the Bible, is your word, and it contains promises like this, I'm going to take your word to the test. I told God that I'm going to stop boxing. I'm going to stop doing everything. I'm going to put my whole life on his promise. And if it works, I told God, that I will preach this to everybody, everywhere, all of the time. And I told God, if it does not work, I'm going to tell people that the Bible is a lie. God is a liar. It's all a big lie. 27 years later now, in the year 2022, I'm still preaching it. God keeps his promises. Here in the written word of God, God has given to us promises to prove him therewith, to reason together with him. We can come to God according to his word, with his word, and reason with him. Well, I got born again back in 1985. I did not even know what that was. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 tells us how we get born again. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. I told God that I believed that promise. I'd believe everything written in his word. I told God that if he kept his promises in his word, in the Bible, I'd believe it from cover to cover. I'd believe the whole thing. I even told God that if my eyes see a contradiction, I'm going to believe the Bible over what my eyes or my mind sees. I'm going to believe his word. I was born again by the incorruptible word of God. A change took place inside of me. I did not know this. I got so excited by the word of God. I got so excited by the promises of God because in the back of the booklet, they had many promises on how to get saved. Romans 10, 13, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, that's in the Bible. I believe it. Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God that raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I'm going to believe it. Okay, that's what the Bible says, that God raised Jesus from the dead. I'm going to believe it and confess the Lord Jesus. It also contains a promise found in the book of John that if any man comes to Christ, he'll in no wise cast him away. I believe it. I got born again. My sins were forgiven. I became a new creature in Christ. I got so excited on the inside, I did not know to say, praise the Lord, or hallelujah. All I knew to say was, yes. My girlfriend looks over at me thinking, what just happened to Tony? Here he was just reading a book, and now he's yelling with his hands in the air. As I see her looking at me in our small little apartment, I tell her, I have found God. He is in the Bible. I am now a Christian. I believe in God. I looked at my wrist, and there was those strings that were given to me by witch doctors. I told her, grab the scissors and cut these strings off me right now. She was a little bit fearful. Are you sure? Cut them off. I want them off right now. She took her scissors and cut those strings off. And as the strings fell off my wrist, I put my hands in the air. 
I felt free. I felt like chains had just come off me because it was spiritual chains I didn't know I was wearing. And as they fell off me, I put my hands in the air and I looked up and there was the shrine of all the different idols, idols and, and fetishes and little things people had given me over the years to give me power, spiritual things, all these what we call fetishes up on the shrine. So I took the shrine off the wall. I found a trash bag. I put that in the trash bag with all those idols. Some of those idols were very expensive and cost a lot of money. I threw it all in the trash bag. Well, then I had all this rap music I've been listening to, gangster rap music, music that glorified death and killing and sin and fornicating and had all curse words in it. I put that in the trash bag. Under my bed, I had all kinds of VHS, the big old videotapes, VHS Hollywood movies that were filled with murder and death and killing. I threw all that in the trash bag. And I told my girlfriend, throw this away, because we're living in an apartment building that had a trash can we throw all the trash at. As she left, I thought, I've got to get away from my friends. My friends were like me, were sinners. They like to do drugs, they like to drink, they like to gamble, they like to street fight. I knew if I was going to be a Christian, I can't be around my friends anymore. So I started calling my friends one by one on the phone to tell them I'm not your friend anymore. I'm a Christian now. If you want to be my friend, you got to go to church. If not, we we'll just cancel our friendships right now. One of my friends was half American, half Thai. His father was Thai and his mother was white American. He had grown up in America. His father didn't pay the taxes and they had to run away from America to Thailand. And that's how we became friends. He says to me on the phone, Tony, you're born again. Say, like, I saw this back in the church I grew up at in America. People like you, real wicked and evil, you get born again, and then you start preaching the gospel. He says, Tony, I can see it right now. You're going to be a preacher. People, I've seen this over and over. You're born again, and now you're going to be a preacher. When he said those words, born again, that was so clear in my mind what that meant. I was born again. My girlfriend is now my wife returned back to her room after throwing all that away in the trash can. I'm smiling and happy now. I'm born again. I've got a word for my experience. I was born again. And then, uh-oh. My girlfriend says, what's wrong? She says, we are now in sin. What we're doing, I didn't know the word fornication back then. I said, there's a word for it. We're in sin. We've got to get married right now. We got to go and get married now or break up. So we went to the Thai courthouse and had to pay different fees and paperwork and things such as that. And finally, that late afternoon that went overtime for us, we were legally married. Now, we needed a witness to sign our marriage contract. My wife had called her mother. I did not know that my girlfriend's mother, who is now my wife, my wife's mother was a born-again Christian. I did not know that back then. And she arrived to the courthouse to sign our paper as a witness with two Bibles in her hand. One of those Bibles was taped together. You see, my wife's mother got born again when my wife was about 14 or 15 years old. And then she took her daughter, my wife, to the church that she was born again at. At this church, they were very zealous. And if you came in as a visitor, they put a little flower on your clothing. They pinned it on you as a visitor. And what happened was the pastor gave the altar call. The ushers would look for people wearing the flower and then pull them up front. They would physically drag them up to the front to answer the altar call. My poor wife didn't know what was going on. She was forced to answer this altar call and pray this prayer that she didn't want to pray. And then after they prayed that prayer, this church was very zealous for spiritual gifts, and they wanted everybody to speak in tongues. And if they didn't speak in tongues, the adults would physically grab tongues, pull it out of the mouth, and wiggle it and say, loose, be loosed. Now, this was a 14-year-old girl, <laughs> and adults were pulling her tongue out of her mouth. She said, I don't want nothing more to do with the church. I'll never become a Christian. I'm out of here. I'm gone. And my wife's mother tried to give her a Bible. She ripped it up and threw it in the trash can. But my wife's mother prayed. Praise God, we can pray. And God answers prayer. And she retrieved that Bible with a trash can, taped it back together by faith, believing one day 
she's going to want this Bible. And that day happened in 1995. My wife had told her, we're born again now, we're Christians, we're getting married. She came as the witness with those two Bibles. And my wife remembered back at that church, though she had a bad experience, they still had testimony time. How important our testimonies are. Our testimonies are so important. The Bible says that we overcome the devil. For they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their life unto the death. Our testimonies we overcome the devil by. She remembered of that church. Men testified how Jesus changed their lives. She remembered how womanizers testified had they stopped womanizing. Gamblers testified they stopped gambling. Drunkers testified they were sober now. She looked at me and thought, Tony is one wicked guy, <laughs> probably the most wicked man she ever met. If Jesus can change Tony, he can change anybody. He is real. She witnessed the change in my life. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. She witnessed that happen in my life and also became a believer and was born again as well. As the Bible says, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. We can come to the Lord and reason with him and he will always win. His wisdom is so much higher than our wisdom. The Bible says that God's ways are much higher than man's ways. As high as the heaven is to the earth, so great are God's ways compared to our ways. If we would come to the Lord and reason with him, he will always win. That's where the devil attacks our reasoning. That's why here in this country, they have legalized marijuana. I used to smoke marijuana. It makes you stupid. You stop using the reasoning. You start using other parts of the brain that make you completely stupid. This whole world is getting stupid. These mobile phones have made people as stupid as stupid can be. You go on the streets today and it's a bunch of zombies just controlled by their phones. They've stopped using the reasoning. The devil always attacks the reasoning. Alcohol is everywhere. The devil pushes that alcohol. I used to drink alcohol. Why is it stop using the reasoning? He goes after our reasoning because if we reason with the Lord, the Lord will always win. I came to God according to his word. I saw his promise and told him I was going to take him at his word. And God won. He keeps his promises. He keeps his word. I was born again by that fact. He became a preacher because of it. For the Bible says, come now and let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be scarlet, they shall, not might, not maybe, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now it is appointed unto men, once did I, but after this the judgment. I now have no fear of death. I have no fear of the judgment of God. Back in 2019, a Filipino brother in Christ probably was the first person to have COVID-19 in Thailand. On that day, he told me to stay away from him. He came to church and he said, stay away. I'm contagious. I've got a, uh, I've got a new form of bird flu and you have to stay away from me. I said, come close, brother. I want to catch it now and get it over with. I'm not afraid of death. I've been preaching that gospel 27 years. I've had knives pulled on me. I have guns pulled on me. I've even had people pull the trigger of guns at my head while I was preaching the gospel. I never cringe in fear. I never ran away. I kept on preaching the gospel. Even back in 2011, a Thai policeman tried to execute me for preaching the gospel. I kept on preaching the gospel nonetheless. I have no fear of death because my sins have been made white as snow. Yes, my sins were many. I don't think I could go through a whole list of them. I think it would take me days to count all of my sins that I've committed. But they no longer exist in the eyes of God. He says, they shall be 
white as snow. They shall be as wool. In the sight of God, I am completely cleansed from all of my sins. Psalm 103. Oh, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Oh, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth thee of all thine iniquities? Who healeth thee of all thine diseases? God forgives us of all. He cleanseth us from all sin. And when we come to the Lord and we reason with him, we can have this born again experience. We can receive salvation. And in that salvation, all of our sins are forgiven. And now we can fearlessly obey his word to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. Because we know where we're going when we die. Back in 1998, my wife and I were preaching the gospel in Pattaya, Thailand. We were staying at a church, and at first they were happy we were there, but what's promised in the Bible? Persecution. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Yea, all who have gone in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That is a promise of God, and we shall suffer persecution. And at that time, in 1998, Pontius Pilate was controlled by mafia. And they sent hitmen to the church to threaten all the church about us. Well, the church wanted to get rid of us, but they didn't have the boldness just to kick us out. So they stopped refilling the drinking water. They stopped putting food in the refrigerator. They were giving us big hints, it's time for you to leave. But we had no money. We couldn't go anywhere. So we kept preaching the gospel. Now, when we had 20 baht, we could take the bot bus, the mini bus, from where the church was to South Patia, preach the gospel and come back. That's all we need, 20 baht. We got no baht, we got to walk. On the baht bus, it took us maybe 20 minutes at the most. Walking, it takes about three hours one way. As we were walking to preach the gospel, we had to then walk back to the church we're staying at. And they were tired. We were worn out. We had been walking and preaching. We didn't have any money for water and things such as that. But on that night, we happened to be in a dark place at the right place at the right time when these Thai gangsters were going to rape and kill this woman. But because we were there, we were able to stop them. Praise the Lord. One of the men was going to take an axe, A-X, axe, and hit me in the head with it. As he was coming to swing at my head, I said, Jesus, because I want to die preaching the gospel. As he swung the axe, his arm got stuck in the air. An unseen hand was holding him. And we're going to preach the gospel to him. Get the girl to safety, preach to her, preach to her mother, and lead them both to the Lord. Because of no fear of death, no fear of problems, God can use to bless us because our sins are forgiven. Are you a Christian? Is your sins forgiven? Do you know without a shadow of doubt that all of your sins have been forgiven? That though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. If so, then do something about it. It's time to rise up. It's time to serve the Lord. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy word which endureth forever. Pray that we may be exhorted in the faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, and God bless.